traverse global supply chains and we explore the remote and extreme landscapes and territories that our contemporary cities set in motion. So all the footage you're gonna see across the next hour is all of our own footage collected from the team out in sites of the Anthropocene, it's a collection of drone footage and hidden camera investigations, a collection of interviews and speculative narratives, a collection of toxic objects, reimagined landscapes, and the cataloging of distributed matter from distant sites. And Unknown Fields tries to relay stories of these places to people like you in rooms like this one. And we make provocative objects and films from all of these expeditions. We're trying to explore the dispersed narratives that coalesce to form our contemporary city. So across the last few years, we've based projects on a cargo ship that's traveling through Asia, tracing our technologies back to the sites of their production. We've traveled through the irradiated wilderness of Chernobyl, Travel through the illegal gem fields and Wild West mining sites cut out of Madagascar's rainforests. We've gone to the mining landscapes of outback Western Australia, and the Arctic ice shelf, and the climate change landscapes of far north Alaska. We've traveled through the US, visiting USO, UFO conspiracy theorists, and visiting black sites of America's military. And we go to all these places because they're iconic sites of the Anthropocene. They're landscapes that are shaped by the immediacy of phenomena that we see emerging only abstractly in the places that people like you and me call home. And we map the complex and contradictory realities of the present as a site of strange and extraordinary futures. And these real sites are then collaged together with the speculative architectures of film that we extrapolate out of them that I develop in my uh, fiction studio based in LA and our Futures Think Tank Tomorrow's Thoughts Today. And here we construct films that explore the implications and consequences of emerging trends, technologies, and ecological conditions. And we bury these stories within the entertainment industry, like Trojan horses, kind of existing, bubbling beneath the surface of the forms of popular culture. And these are really the two aspects of the work that I do that I want to bring together today, um, where we animate alternative worlds as a means to understand our own world in new ways. It's a form of extrapolating the present in order to develop counter-narratives. It's this process of sifting through the detritus of the everyday, like uh, archeologists rummaging for fragments of who we are, and then realigning these pieces into new constellations where we exaggerate the world and treat expeditions through it like location shoots for a film or the scraps of a new film set to construct stories from the remains of the moment, to reveal invisible connections, emerging phenomena, and strange new worlds. Worlds like this one, which is a film called uh, Where the Sea Can't See. It's set in a fictional future Detroit. And I'm not gonna show the full film here today, but rather what I wanted to do was unpack it and narrate the world in which this film might be set. It's a film based on our research into the cities and landscapes of the Anthropocene, into the special economic zones in China, and the new future technologies of the smart city that all come together into this Detroit special economic zone. It's the first film shot entirely using LiDAR scanners, which is the for example, navigate and understand the world through this technology. And in the film, across a single night, we follow a group of young car factory workers as 
they drift through the city in a driverless taxi. And they're part of an underground community that work on the production lines by day, but at night they adorn themselves in machine vision camouflage in order to enact their escapist fantasies in the hidden spaces of the city. And they hack the smart city and journey through a network of stealth buildings and ruinous landscapes, ghost architectures, glitches, and sprites searching for the wilds beyond the machine. And 
here in our taxi, we drive along the azure shores of the city's energy pools, through Chile and Bolivia, through a land that's no longer of an indigenous population, but of evaporation ponds of the world's largest lithium mines. So this is the landscape behind the scenes of all the batteries that power our technologies. 70% of the world's lithium is here, says the city. You can't see it on the desperately flat horizon or access it by any public road. Its mystery is protected by its isolation. But through the eyes of a drone, we see our technology splayed out before us. Because lithium development is not mining through extraction, but through a form of evaporation. We see a tessellated ocean of evaporation ponds where each shift in hue signals a rising concentration of lithium salts. And from above the earth, the ground comes alive with the colors of lithium electricity. And meanwhile, on a stage in California, Elon Musk, the tech evangelist and entrepreneur, proclaims his vision for a green future, a world where everything will be solar in 20 years. But like most Silicon Valley preachers, he's presenting to us a seductive future, a hopeful future, but at the same time, it's a decidedly uncomplicated future. Elon Musk must literally now buy Bolivia and evolve it as the new Dubai because if the future is electric, then the future is also here, buried beneath the salt flats of Bolivia. And now we get back in our taxi and we keep on driving. landscapes of our ephemeral technologies. So it's in these massive mining excavations scattered on the edge of the world that our city everywhere begins and ends its life. And we each have a little bit of the gold or aluminium from these sites in the technologies in our pockets, charged and quietly vibrating. And Aboriginal Dreamtime narratives speak of a time when the ground was soft and creation beings shaped mountains and rivers. When the rainbow serpent slinked across the ground to create a river, and a wild dog came to rest to form a mountain. And now as the lights of the city wash out the sky, these song lines walked by these ancestral spirits are sung anew, this time with the tracks laid down by the mining industry. And the dreaming landscape that embodied the creation stories of Aboriginal Australians is now overlaid with a vast infrastructure of resource speculation and financial fictions. And geological survey planes track back and forth, laser scanning the earth, searching for topographic anomalies that indicate pockets of undiscovered minerals in the ground. And the digital models that they create of these landscapes are now linked live to the fluctuations of metal prices on the stock market. And as explosive diggers and drills have replaced the slow erosion of rivers and earthquakes, we can see that we're now scoring our economy and the digital permutations of the modern world into the geological and archaeological record. And the landscape we see a collection of vehicles that are just like the one we're now sitting in, that no longer have drivers, but are just systems. And mining trucks rumble up mountains, and tractors carve soil along GPS trails. And now we drive deeper into the dust. And we can see the rhythms of the human conveyor belts of Madagascar. It's one of the planet's precious ecological treasures. It's also home to one of its poorest nations. And here, it raises difficult questions about the relationship between technology, necessity, and luxury. Most of the world's sapphires are pulled out of the ground by the human conveyor belts of Madagascar's gem fields. Hidden amidst political uncertainty, the island's fragile and unique ecology is being smuggled out illegally boat by boat, gem by gem. 
and red tortoises leave in rucksacks, and precious stones are smug smuggled from the earth and then shoveled onto the stage in pop star bling. And in these illegal mines, it's cheaper to pay 20 men in rice than it is to maintain and fuel a mechanical conveyor belt. So a hidden black market supply chain connects two choreographies, one in these lawless mine sites and the other in the jewelry stores, hip hop music videos and celebrity red carpets across the ocean. So for the jewelry of city everywhere, unknown fields have used the amount of rice that the human conveyor belt consumes in a day to manufacture a precious stone that embodies the systems through which these worlds are intimately and profoundly collected. So the red Madagascan rice that is grown endemically on this treasured island is a staple food of the miners and it's been collected locally and shipped to specialists for carbon analysis. And by subjecting the rice to extreme heat and pressure in the laboratory, we're able to form a single synthetic diamond encoded with the sum of the human conveyor belt's labor. And after manufacture, the gemstone had been set into a gold tooth, ready for that million dollar smile and the outrageous lyric. So from killer jewels to carrots to the nightclub, in the glare of this cheeky gold grin, we see the cost of luxury, of beauty, of a daily allowance of rice, and of 20 men shoveling at the bottom of a hole. And in our taxi, we continue to follow the breadcrumbs of technology and we arrive at a village organized around metals and hardware components. And we see another group of villagers that vary not by soil, but by the collective piles of e-waste gathered in their houses. These mines of discarded technology surround their living, sleeping, and eating spaces. And they mine their domestic landscapes for lead and neodymium, tin, nickel, and copper. And next to the pot of noodles simmers the acid bath dissolving circuit wafers, separating metals, and flavoring soup. And close by, our driverless taxi rolls up to the shores of the radioactive lake in Inner Mongolia that sits beside the world's largest rare earth mineral refinery. And we take a selfie with our phones and we see our reflection in its mirrored screen because the material that polishes glass and run its software produces this very lake and collapse together in a single luminous surface, we see ourselves and this black, black earth. And from this radioactive sludge, we've made a vase for the city operating system to thank it for showing us around. It's a set of vases made from the amount of radioactive waste created in the production of three objects, an iPhone, a MacBook, and a Tesla electric car battery. It's a new material aesthetic for the technology born of the earth. It's a Ming vase for the city everywhere generation. And now the city takes us to where all this raw material is refined and shaped into the familiar objects that fill our lives. Almost all of the world's Christmas decorations are made here, the city says. That tree lighting up your house, the novelty hat that you wear to an office Christmas party, it's all made here. And it's made by the human machines of the city, orchestrated by efficiency algorithms. These are the real robots of our new landscapes of technology, where the body is matched in speed to the conveyor belt that turns in front of it. And here we find 90% of the world's electronics. And we brand our technology with terms like cloud, air, and featherweight. But in reality, they're violently wrenched from the earth. And as our personal electronics tend towards the invisible, they conjure in their shadows an undeniably visible gray mountain, a one kilometer deep pit, a 10 square kilometer radioactive tailings lake, all landscapes that are a counterweight to the apparent immateriality of computing, communications, and electric energy. 
And the infrastructure of the digital world has these extraordinary implications on material experience. These are the architectures behind the screen and beyond the fog of the smart city cloud. These are the physical outputs of our digital engagement with the world. But here in City Everywhere, perhaps we can start to imagine redesigning our gadgets, not based on how they slide into our pockets or feel in our hand, but for the networks they set in motion, or the economic resources they might distribute. What could the alternative design criteria be for supply chain engineering if it wasn't designed around cheap labor costs and material availability? And we jump back in our car, and we keep on driving. And in the same area of the city, we see a camera flash, a model pouts, and the whip of a hip catches the eye on a catwalk. Fast fashion's rolling tide dumps mountains of cheap clothing onto the high street shores. Objects of desire, worn for one wild night and destined to be discarded. Now on our tour through the post Anthropocene, we pick at a loose thread on the garment we're all wearing and we unravel it to cross continents from wardrobe to warehouse, from factory to field, in search of our runway dreams and street blue jeans. Before we wear them, our clothes make journeys of tens of thousands of miles in their production. Textiles is actually the most globalized industry on the planet. And the byproduct of this pace and scale of production is the destruction of the very thing that brought the industry to Southeast Asia originally. Here we meet the last generation of master weavers, a group whose skills is now dying with them. The apprentices they were once trained now man the rumbling mechanized looms of global fashion, raw cotton plugging their ears, deaf to the din of the world around them. And we visit the last real gold thread maker, an alchemist who lovingly tweaks the machine his grandfather made, resisting the move to synthetic, cheap, and fake yarns used by all the other countries around him. And we span from fashion victim to victims of fashion. And for the cloth of City Everywhere, Unknown Fields has woven a collaborative textile with the last gold thread maker and one of the last true master weavers in Varanasi. And audio from a series of interviews with these endangered craftspeople and the sound of their looms is translated into this binary pattern. And it's woven into the cloth. So the textile becomes an archive encoded with the skills of a dying craft and woven from the same hands that it's trying to remember. And to make the thread for the textile, we follow container ships that bring fast fashion to our shores all the way back to their death. After their short 25-year lifespan, they return to India and Bangladesh to be broken up and salvaged in the shipbreaking yards. And we collected fragments of this raw steel from the Bangladeshi shores cut from the rusting carcasses of ships to form the core of the gold thread. It's a textile archive born from the skeletons of the industry that brought it into being. And the cloth now covers a young Indian textile walker who's walking slowly on a sacred procession from her home village amongst the cotton fields to the huge mills and factories of the vast textile industry where she works. And as she walks across city everywhere, she's gradually wrapped in this glistening gold textile. She bears witness to a series of transformations, weaving, dyeing, sewing, and pressing. And finally her journey suggests the walk along the fashion catwalk and the path that our disposable fashion takes in its global production and the path so many women like her have taken in moving from village to factory to city. And her journey ends as she's completely cocooned 
boxed up, ready for shipping, standing at the huge container port amongst the mega container ships. That